Next, we move to Guy Stromza. Uh, yes. Professor Guy Stromza. Sorry, can you hear me? Is Martin Buber Professor Emeritus of Comparative Religion at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and Professor Emeritus of the Study of the Abrahamic Religions and Emeritus Fellow of Lady Margaret Hall University of Oxford. He is a member of the Israel Academy of Sciences and Humanities and holds an honorary doctorate from the University of, of um, Zurich. He received the Humboldt Research Award, the Leopold Lucas Prize, and the Rothschild Prize. He is a Chevalier de l'Ordre du Mérité and an author of 18 books and 150 articles, an editor or co-editor of 21 more books. So welcome, Thank Guy. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, Tamar. I'll try to... Uh, to stay within the limits of the 19 hours and 36 minutes uh, left. Um, but before I start, I want to express my personal thanks to Paul Mendes Flor and to the late Bernd Witte, whom I met through Paul. Paul and Bernd have been, for many years, the chief editors the general editors of the 23 volumes of uh, Martin Buber's Gesammelte Schriften. And this conference, which has been postponed at least two or three times due to the pandemic, is supposed uh, to commemorate uh, the end of this uh, stupendous uh, effort, collective effort of uh, Paul and Bernd. So thank you, Paul. I thank you also for, through you, having been able to meet Bernd Witte, who was a, a very fine scholar and a very fine person also. Um, and I want to uh, thank uh, Jonathan Meir, who has left now, but uh, Jonathan uh, uh, agreed a year ago to replace me as uh, in being in charge of this conference. Is there such a thing as Hebrew humanism? In other words, if humanism by definition implies universality, is not Hebrew humanism an oxymoron? Historically, of course, the phenomenon of humanism in European intellectual history was born with the Renaissance of early modernity, whose impact on Jewish communities remained at best marginal. To some extent, a Jewish Renaissance of sorts happened later under the Enlightenment with the Haskalah movement and its discovery of new secular uses of the Hebrew language. In many ways, this Hebrew Renaissance would blossom with the Zionist rebirth of Hebrew as both a vernacular and language of culture, as well as a return to the land of Israel. After the Shoah, in Palestine and everywhere else, the vocable Renaissance took a more immediate meaning, referring to a people literally reborn from its ashes. Throughout the 20th century then, it is also in Hebrew that Jewish humanists sought to express themselves, seeking in the hallowed language of the earliest sources the roots of their own search for humanism. Today, reflecting on the idea of Hebrew humanism, its conditions and implications, is an urgent desideratum. Indeed, leaders of most political parties in the new governing coalition in Israel do not hide their brutal and total rejection of humanism, both the concept and its practice, in the name of the Jewish religious tradition. For them, humanism is but a term of opprobrium, while a war is to be waged against humanists and liberals of any color these new sons of darkness. The idea of Hebrew humanism was powerfully envisioned by two towering Jewish thinkers of the 20th century, Martin Buber, Vienna 1878, Jerusalem 1965, already before the First World War, and Emmanuel Levinas, Kovno 1905, Paris 1995, in the wake of the Second World War. Both were all students who had received a strong Hebrew education in their childhood, but had had distinct trajectories and were highly different by temperament and education. Buber inclined to Hasidic mysticism, 
while Levinas clearly reflected the intellectual rationalistic tradition of the Lithuanian Talmudists. Moreover, while Buber remained since its youth deeply attracted by the wisdoms of the East and of the North, as we heard this morning with the Kalevala, uh, Levinas remained throughout his life a European in his identity and intellectual tastes. Both adopted early in life the two main languages of intellectual communication in Europe of the first half of the 20th century, German for Buber, French for Levinas. Comparing them not only stands to reason, it is called for. Both were deeply preoccupied with ethical and political problems. Again, we heard about that today. Which for them stood at the very core of the Jewish tradition. Moreover, Buber's insistence on the power of interpersonal relations, Ichundu, may be compared to Levinas' revelatory experience of the other through her or his face, le, vila, le visage de l'autre. I must add that in my last years of high school in Paris, more than half a century ago, I was privileged to have Levinas introduce me both to philosophy and to the Talmud. Although I never met Buber, who died a year before I came to Jerusalem, I was honored to become the Martin Buber Professor of Comparative Religion at the Hebrew University. I'm going to skip parts of my argument for the sake of the 14 minutes left. Um, so I, I hope you will be able to catch with the, with the uh, jumps uh, in the argument. Since the early years of the past century, Buber has, had been a staunch advocate of what he usually called Hebrew humanism, although he sometimes referred to it as a Jewish Renaissance. In 1913 already, he proposed an educational program for a Jewish school in Germany whose approach would be that of a Hebrew humanism. In a speech at the Zionist Congress in 1929, he lamented that Hebrew humanism was missing from the educational system in the yeshuv. It seems that it still is. He kept coming back to the topic and to the expression in his later years. The most extensive essay, Hebraischer Humanismus, dates from 1941 so when he was already in Palestine. But the theme reappears in one of Buber's last texts, read on the occasion of his being awarded the Erasmus Prize in Rotterdam in 1963. Buber's conception of Hebrew humanism is anchored in his understanding of the Zionist revolution as a spiritual, cultural, and intellectual, as well as a, as well as a political renaissance what he calls a Wiedergeburt des jüdischen Volkes und des jüdischen Menschen, a rebirth of the Jewish people and the Jewish man or person. In other words, this revolution should be compared to the Italian Renaissance and parallel to the humanesimo of the 15th century and Hebrew humanism should form the intellectual and spiritual core of Jewish rebirth. The Italian humanists of the Renaissance had called for a return to the texts and values of Greece and Rome. For the Jews, the return would not be to Sophocles and Thucydides, but to the Hebrew Bible, our antiquity, unsere antike. In the Bible, Jews should be able to find the model of Hebraische humanitas, valid for our own day. What are the major elements of this humanitas? First of all, the language itself, just as the study of antiquity is first and foremost the study of classical languages, so the return to the Bible should, re should begin with a return to its language. Buber reflects here an attitude to language inherited from the Herderian and Humboldtian tradition. Language defines the boundaries between human and non-human and is therefore an essential element of any understanding of humanism. For Buber, then, Hebrew humanism mirrors the national renaissance of the Jews in Zion. Although he starts using the concept before the Shoah, it appears clearly that his affirmation of a Jewish form of humanism represents also his response to the murderous barbarism of the Nazis. 
Although Levinas grew up in Lithuania, a country with the most remarkable tradition of Talmud teaching, he had not been immersed in this literature before the war. His parents, who had chosen the path to modernity, insisted on a Hebrew education for their son, but not on the traditional patterns of learning. His rediscovery of the Talmud after the war would then be for him the expression of a return teshuvah in Hebrew, or repentance. It permitted him to go back to the tradition of his forefathers that he had more or less ignored in his youth before the catastrophe. Levinas's life was literally and brutally split into two by the Second World War. He spent five years in a German Stalag as a French prisoner of war, thus being in some ways protected from the genocidal machine of the Nazi death camps. Meanwhile, his wife and his daughter in occupied France survived by hiding in a Christian convent. After the war, he learned that all his family had been murdered in Lithuania. His life, like that of so many others, Jews and Gentiles alike, would never be the same. Levinas transformed the dramatic rupture represented by the Shoah and the perplexing loss of traditional values into a dialectical bridge. Through this bridge, he returned to the canonical texts of Judaism, in particular the Talmud, the very core of the Jewish tradition of biblical hermeneutics. Doing so, he succeeded in offering readings of the ancient texts through the lens of modern the philosophy. Levinas returned to the texts of old, however, without renouncing cutting-edge philosophical research. Setting himself in Husserl's footsteps, he soon stood as one of Heidegger's most powerful opponents. This he did precisely through his powerful, paradoxical, powerful claim of precedence of ethics on metaphysics. Levinas knew Buber and deeply respected him. Both sought to read the Jewish sources in a way that would make them relevant today and relevant to both Gentiles and Jews. For Buber and Levinas alike, Humanism is always rooted in a particular linguistic, cultural, and religious tradition, but the hermeneutics of the tradition and the interpretation of the texts should always open them up to all men and women. There remains, however, a deep difference between their approaches, which lies in the kind of texts they chose to discuss. Buber never hid his profound attraction to the mystical traditions of the East as well as of the West, Unearthing the Hasidic tales and digging up their spiritual message was one of the main tasks he set, to, he set to himself. In this, Buber was true to his geographical origins in Lemberg, the Polish Lvov and the Ukrainian Lviv, then in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, a location close to the great centers of Hasidism. On his side, Levinas, as I said, remained true to the tra intellectualist tradition of his native Lithuania. In other words, while Buber emphasizes the universal religious value of the Jewish texts, Levinas tries to stress their ethical power insofar as they deal with essentially human affairs. Like Buber, Levinas listens to the call for justice of the prophets of Israel. Unlike him, however, he heeds their call not directly, but through the hermeneutics of, a, of the rabbis. A religion for adults. This is how Levinas describes rabbinic Judaism, a religion focusing the attention to the utmost on the detail of human attitudes and behavior, an ethical religion, and hence a universalism despite its traditional perception in a Christian society as a particularism. Similarly, Judaism represents for Levinas the spirit of the text, although it is only through the letter that the spirit can be discovered. In that sense, Israel is equivalent to humankind and all adults, that is to say, people run by ethical concerns, may now be called Jews. I quote, any man who is truly human probably belongs to Abraham's seed. Against the dictum of the second century Christian church father Tertullian, Anima Naturaliter Christiana, 
human nature is uh, the, the, the human soul is by nature Christian. Levinas can almost propose his own anima naturaliter judaica. Retrieving Judaism is tantamount to retrieving humanity. After the war, Levinas learned how to read the old Jewish texts in a fresh manner, speaking in the cons to the concerns of modern men. He was thus released from the Christian temptation of his youth and found his own voice when teaching these texts himself side by side with his philosophical work. Through his teaching, Levinas contributed for a whole generation in masterful fashion to the intellectual rebuilding of the French Jewish community after the Shoah. He did so in parallel to his daily ac educational activities at the yearly colloquia of the French Jewish Francophone intellectuals. The dialectics between old texts and modern problems is predicated upon a belief that in what really matters ethically, in the laws ruling interhuman relations, there is nothing new under the sun. Or more precisely, everything has already been thought long ago. And it does not matter here if one reads the Talmud or Aeschylus's Eumenides. What counts for Levinas is that the best in the old Jewish texts rejoin the best in Greek literature. One example, a short text of Levinas dating from 1956 is entitled For a Hebrew Humanism, Pour un Humanisme Hebraïque. This text, which speaks about a difficult wisdom, difficile sagesse, summarizes in a nutshell many of the themes mentioned above. I want to end with some reflections on Hebrew humanism or the lack thereof in Israeli consciousness. It remains a puzzling fact that despite the central place of the Bible in the national ethos, and despite Ben-Gurion's publicized prize, pride in the Hebrew prophets, the immediate implications of what is often branded as their universalist message have been too rarely discussed. Buber and his colleagues at Brit Shalom, including such pivotal Hebrew figures as Gershom Sholem and Judah Leib, Leib Magnes, remained rather marginal in the Yishuv and in Israeli society. Side by side with the avowed respect for their wisdom and knowledge, deep suspicion has constantly surrounded the liberal intellectuals who called for political decisions based on the ethical demands of justice and equality between Jew and Arab in the land of the prophets. Let us return to the idea of a Jewish or Hebrew humanism. The concept has recently been described as a contradiction in terms. In fact, the most famous example of such a claim was represented by Yeshayahu Leibovitch. Leibovitch, a polymath scientist at the Hebrew University and an orthodox Jew, argued that humanism, which insists on the centrality of man in the universe, entailed an atheist attitude and as such was to be fought. I will, not, I will skip a passage I have here on the German Hebraist and Orientalist, the late German Hebraist and Orientalist Friedrich Niewöhner, who argued that the very essence of Judaism prevents it from accommodating humanism and he establishes himself precisely on uh, Leibovitch. Let me come back finally to my opening remarks on the urgency of a reflection on humanism in Israel today. For both Buber and Levinas, as well as for Hermann Cohen and Ernst Kassirer, uh, true religion was, with in different ways to be sure, was focused on ethics while the active presence of myth in religious phenomena pointed to dangerous, worrisome dimensions of religion. It is more duties rather than rights that are the lot of Jews as the chosen people of the universal God. Gershon Sholem, who was fascinated throughout his life by the power of mystical religion, remained keenly aware of the deep threats to the very existence of the Jewish people stemming from the idea of messianism, when unleashed. In an interview on Israeli television shortly before his death in 1982, 
he expressed his fear that Gushe Munim, he expressed his fear of Gushe Munim and of the idea of the greater Israel, which, just like the Sabbatian movement of the 17th century, might lead the Jewish people to a catastrophe of historical dimensions. A generation later, we see plainly the abyss where such trends are leading us. The fact that today the democratic and the Jewish dimensions of Israel are commonly perceived as antithetical is a striking reminder of the need to heed to the voices of Buber and Levinas. Thank you.